This video is sponsored by Opera GX. But you should know, I'm using this browser even when they're not paying me to do it. Look, here I am using it on stream months ago. I have an affinity for this browser that is akin to that of Will Smith's love for his wife. One reason I am such a fan is because, as a chronic multitasker, it allows me to comfortably keep a lot going on in the background without clogging up my computer's performance when I'm gaming or video editing. It also comes with a ton of customization, sound effects, background music, keyboard feedback, live wallpapers, shaders, colors. Honestly, it can be a little overwhelming. Love often is. But with the new GX mod feature, I can customize all of that around a single theme with a simple click of the button, just like this new GX boy mod. And if this one isn't for you, I'll bet there's one with your name on it. A great touch as well is that if you don't want all of the features of a mod, you can hop over here to the right sidebar, click here, and then specifically set what you do and don't want. Oh, and I can't do an Opera GX ad without mentioning the GX Corner, which has been extremely helpful in managing my backlog. It keeps future game releases compiled here, current game sales compiled here, and my latest 12 videos compiled here. But to get that last feature, you gotta use my super secret not so secret link down below. Did I mention that Opera GX is free? And look, I get it, swapping browsers is a pain, what with passwords and bookmarks being a thing, unless you swap to Opera GX because they make it as easy as settings, synchronization, import bookmarks and settings, and import. So thanks again to Opera GX, my beloved, for sponsoring, and be sure to use my link below to download Opera GX today. With all of that said, let's start the show. Can I tell you a story? So I'm playing Tears of the Kingdom and I'm working on a shrine where I have to get this gem across to this island. I've attached it to a glider that I built with some materials that were laying near the gym, but I'm having trouble getting it to launch because the ground here is rough. There isn't one of those runways I typically use. Eventually, I realize what this cart left here is for, so I give my plane some wheels and I'm off. It was a nice little aha moment because I hadn't considered that the cart could be used that way up until now since I had always had a runway, but it made total sense. This isn't why I'm telling you this story. It was at this moment that I knew I had made a fucky wucky. Somehow I completely overshot my target. I forgot that even if I deactivated the fans, that this thing wouldn't just drop straight down, it still had wings and it would keep on gliding, which it did for a good long while. But in a moment of rare brilliance, a long dormant synapse fired in the back of my mind and activated the Jimmy Neutron brain blast sleeping deep inside. I ran to the edge and whipped out recall, thinking that maybe, just maybe, I could bring it all back and control Z my snafu. So I'm looking, I'm scanning, and I see something, some kind of path tucked beneath the clouds and holy smokes, I think that's actually my plane. I might have just unfumbled the bag. It's coming, it's coming, I see it, I've got it, I drop it, and then just like that, all according to plan, I, the gym is gone. The gym is, uh, the gym is gone, despite it being attached just a second ago, just like everything else. As far as video game puzzles go, only the companion cube debacle has ever taken me on such an emotional roller coaster before. You use an ice your face while companion cube more quickly than any test subject on record. Congratulations. After digging up my face from my hands, I laughed and moved on. But in that moment, I felt cheated. I felt robbed because it seemed like the game wasn't following its rules. The recall brought everything else back. Up until now, it always did. Why wouldn't the gym that I actually need be there as well? Now listen, I'm a big boy. I wasn't really that butthurt about this. I've been doing game analysis for five years now, and I have been playing them since before a lot of you were born, and I'd like to think that I have at least a reasonable understanding of how game development works. I'm sure there's just a distance threshold that should the gym cross, it will just respawn at its original spot so that you never completely lose it. It's actually good design, and in fact that seemed to be exactly what happened to the gym when I went back to where I originally found it later. I understand why it happened, and I was only upset for a moment, but when I saw that plane come back without the gym, how could I not feel robbed? Cheating is not fun when you are the one being cheated. When you find out that someone can see your board in a round of Battleship, it sucks all of the enjoyment out of it. The idea of aimbots existing for online shooters makes you wonder what the point in playing even is. In competition, digital, tabletop, and physical, cheating is almost always frowned upon. 
And it might be why for me, and for a good crowd of others, some of the puzzles and the travel in Tears of the Kingdom being so open-ended is a bit uncomfortable. In a lot of cases, the solutions we come up with might feel like cheating. Because while I could figure out whatever the hell I'm supposed to do with these rails to get this treasure chest, I could also just hold up a platform for a moment, drop it, then make an elevator with recall to gain some altitude and glide over to grab the goods. There are a lot of shrine puzzles and even a lot of open world obstacles that can be completely circumvented with a little bit of creative cheese. And uh, to me at least, it often feels cheap. Now I asked you guys not long ago if you agreed, and while most of you said, nah, here's why it's fun actually to outsmart the game, for myself and for some folks, there is a strange sour sensation to thinking that we missed the correct way to complete a challenge. Did I really beat this shrine if I was able to skip portions of it? Is this really a Zelda game if I can just fly over half of a challenge? Am I really the hero of Hyrule if I build a mech to systematically obliterate the non-believers? The answer is probably yes, right? Like, of course you did, of course it is, and of course you are. And if you agree and think, well, obviously, because the game gives all of these abilities to you, then let me ask you this. Can I really say I've beaten a boss in Elden Ring if I use the Mimic Tear Spirit Ash? Ooh, you didn't like that one, did you? In case you are out of the loop here, in Elden Ring, there are these things called spirit ashes that you can summon to help you fight. They've got wolves, they've got hawks, they've got you. And you are easily the most controversial spirit ash in the game. The Mimic Tear will summon a copy of your character to fight alongside you and make fights easier. It has your moves, it has your armor, it has your weapons, and this caused a great many people to become greatly displeased. I've heard it all. By using the Mimic, you're ruining the intended difficulty. It trivializes bosses. You didn't really beat Elden Ring if you used the Mimic. The Mimic is cheap. The Mimic is busted. The Mimic ruined my quinceanera. In a nutshell, a lot of people were vexed because having this option, in their opinion, tarnished the Souls game experience and made things way too easy. And I'm not saying I totally agree. You paid your $60. Play the damn game however you see fit. The point is to have fun, not meet the community's expectations of you. If you want to use it, use it. But if I'm being totally honest, I personally did feel just a bit like a criminal for leaning on the Mimic to finish the game. Even if this method was perfectly legal, it felt dirty to take this shortcut, and yes, it was as if I was ruining the quote-unquote intended experience, which is the same vibes I occasionally get whenever I'm playing Tears of the Kingdom. I'll give you an example. A week or so after the game dropped, I made the mistake of logging into Twitter, and I saw someone post a video about this little skip. By attaching a rocket to their shield, they were able to just whip it out, shoot up towards the ceiling, and parasail right to the end of the shrine. And it was not the only video I found like this. I swallowed a strange cocktail of wonder and regret at knowing that this was possible. Part of me thought it was cool as hell, part of me thought, oh wonderful, now I'll be tempted to do that if I get stuck in a shrine. Now I'll be tempted to do that if I'm too lazy to deal with traversing some landscape. The same thing happened with this hoverbike design that's been making the rounds. Much like the Mimic tier, I could feel the cheap, easy button guilt creeping back up on me. Having posted that question for you guys and seeing the mixed bag of responses, I started to wonder why this flexibility and problem solving bothers some of us so much more than it does others. One reason may be the precedent set by previous games in the series. Because in the past, there was less flexibility in travel. It was horse or... <laughs> There was less flexibility in combat. You weren't summoning a clone to help with Ornstein and Smo, and you certainly weren't building a Gundam to take on a Lionel. There was less flexibility in problem solving. Typically, you'd only find one or two ways to get through puzzles, and it usually called on you using specifically the dungeon's item and traversing the dungeon in a mostly fixed order. Nintendo wanted to keep you on fewer paths and give you fewer options at first, so that when you finally do find that bow or hookshot or bag of wind, it'll open up new areas that you couldn't access before. You had to use that item. No rocket shield, no octo balloons, no contraption. 
its tight design because it ensures that you get the item, learn how to use it, and feel closure when it gets you past where you were stuck. But because it is so tight, there isn't really room for flexibility or creativity, and that's what an entire generation of Zelda fans know to be the tried and true problem-solving formula. Dungeons and Tears of the Kingdom, however, are much more open-ended. In the Wind Temple, for example, you'll have to activate these turbines located on your map. You can start by flying in from the side of the ship to find this faulty fan puzzle for your first turbine, or you can instead fly under the ship to get your first turbine, which opens up this door and leads you up to that faulty fan room. The order you solve these locks in is totally up to you because it's not banking on you learning about some new item that'll recontextualize the places you've gotten stuck. You solve all of this with what Link already has on him and what's in between your ears. So for some of us, what has felt like the Zelda experience for most of our lives is not exactly what we're getting anymore. Traditions are being broken, the DNA of the series is mutating, and that's exactly what series director Aiji Aonuma is aiming for. When speaking to Game Informer about Ocarina of Time's influence on its predecessors, he stated that it sort of became the format for a number of titles in the franchise after it. And you can see the echoes of its design in Majora's Mask, Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword, and adamant insistence on puzzles and dungeons that have an intended way of unraveling, usually revolving around a single mechanic or theme that is introduced in each dungeon. But looking back, Aonuma considers that format a bit restricting for them in regards to the freedoms that they would like to give the player. He says, now that we've arrived at Breath of the Wild and the new type of more open play and freedom that it affords, I think it's correct to say that it has created a new kind of format for the series to proceed from. Zelda is evolving and the intended experience some of us are hung up on may not actually be the intended one, but the preconceived one. The point moving forward might actually be to cheat, or more accurately, discover methods that feel like cheating. Let me tell you another story. The day after discovering the rocket shield trick online, I was stumbling my merry way across Hyrule when I happened upon this funny little shrine, where an enemy dropped a shield with a flame emitter attached to it. I grabbed it, melted this ice, and moved on. In the next room, an enemy dropped a shield with a stone slab attached to it, a shield it was using to block the flames from my shield, by the way. I put two and two together and used the attached slab to block these flames and move on. In the third room, the enemy did not have a shield, but there was a massive wall looming overhead, and I was surrounded by Zonai rockets and a few spare shields that seemed to whisper an idea. Oh, the game tells you how to rocket jump. It, it requires it here. This is not cheese that some schmuck online discovered. This is a tool that developers want me to know about. And initially I kind of thought, okay, well maybe it's just a one trick pony. They needed a shrine puzzle idea and this just happened to be one. But across the way from that shrine after I left, my eyes couldn't help but be drawn to a beautifully timed opportunity to use that trick I had just learned. It was as if it was placed here intentionally, almost as if to say, hey, not for nothing, but uh, that sure is about the same height as that wall you just shot over. They want me to notice this spot. They want me to realize that I can use this outside of the shrine. They want me to remember this trick for later. This game wants me to cheat. And this wasn't the first time they taught me a trick in this manner. On the tutorial island, there are these hooks and boards right outside of the shrine that teaches you what you can do with hooks and boards. The same is true of this shrine that makes you use plain parts inside and leaves plain parts for you outside. There are a lot of places in this game where Nintendo actually tempts you with the quote unquote cheap solution. Notice in this clip of me taking a hot air balloon past all of this platforming and enemies that none of these pieces are auto built. I didn't even use a capsule, all of these were just laying at the bottom of this pass. If the developers were intending me only to fight my way up, they have a weird way of showing it. 
If they really wanted me to not have access to this option, they would have disabled my capsules, disabled auto build, and only provided me with exactly what they wanted me to have, just like they do in most of the shrines. We all know that the lift and drop elevator recall trick is wildly convenient. At any given moment, all you need is a movable object that you can stand on and some solid ground. And as long as you have those, you can gain some altitude and parasail off to go over a ton of obstacles. So naturally, if you see a problem that it will solve, why would you search for a new solution? Why would you get up and unplug the TV when you have a perfectly good remote with a power button in your hand? And this was my mentality here. I found a big door with a gap at the top. I had a nice couple of blocks, and so I got to making myself a way up. I stack them, float them, reverse them, ascend up through them, and... Oh shit, I'm still way too low. Can't whip out a rocket. Capsules are banned here. Can't do an auto build either. I guess I actually have to figure this out. And I'm glad I had to because it was a satisfying puzzle. You see, because Zelda taught you how to do the rocket jump, it's aware it exists and therefore can keep you from using it when they want you to learn another lesson. Because that is what a ton of these shrines are. They are lessons. They are here to teach you more about the mechanics you've been given. In this shrine, where they show you how the bounce and sky boats work, the final room is completely sealed off in every direction and is too high for you to ascend into. There are also no objects provided here that you can use to cheat your way in. Believe me, I tried. I don't know why it took me so long to figure this shrine out. They want to ensure that you don't cheese it so that you come away with the lesson that, hey, you're going to want to know how to hit a small target off of some of these big jumps. And sure enough, I would. Lots and lots of shrines are built this way. This one with the giant wheel was really throwing me for a loop, but my ultra hand wouldn't reach high enough for me to skip over the main mechanic of the shrine. There was absolutely no way to get to the other side of the doors in this shrine without understanding exactly what was intended. They wanted me to learn that when you unfreeze the recall, it doesn't just keep going forward in time. It stops all momentum, which was something that I hadn't fully grasped until I saw how these balls just dropped right in place instead of continuing along their initial path. So when I see stuff like this, where bringing the rocket shield into the shrine actually does let you skip something, I don't fret much about it anymore. Nintendo knows about the toys it's giving you. If you cheese something, it's only because they figured you might and want you to feel clever. When Al Numa was asked about this, he laughed and said, when you think about people, cheating is fun. They like it. Finding that shortcut is enjoyable. People will look for an easy way to do something if they can avoid struggling. We want to make sure that that is something that stayed in this game. And I think he's absolutely right. Cheating is fun. More accurately though, in this case, exploiting the rules is fun because Tears of the Kingdom doesn't let you break its rules as much as it leaves plenty of room for you to bend them. When you're able to exploit the tools it gives you in a way that maybe your friends didn't think of, it shows you have a deeper understanding of the mechanics. It's flattering to know that you trailblazed a solution instead of retreading the same path as everyone else. Which is why I felt so robbed when I used recall to bring back my plane and the gym was gone. In that moment, the game broke its own rules. I had a really clever solution that the game innocently did not honor. In most other cases though, they want to honor your creativity and not punish you for drawing outside the lines with colors that they gave you. The only exception being when they intend for you to learn something new or when they want to keep you from losing a gem. And realizing this, the more I played and the more I wrote this video, made me feel much, much better about this open-ended type of design and hopefully helps you if you've ever played and felt bad for taking shortcuts. The brilliance of Tears of the Kingdom shines in several ways, one of which is that it lets you feel like you're cheating without ever actually letting you cheat yourself out of any intended solutions. If there is a puzzle that wants you to solve one way, it makes you solve it that way. If it wants you to think outside the box, it leaves that box open. That's how it gets away with its open-ended design. 
Most of you, whenever I asked about this, didn't think you were missing an intended experience. You felt clever because the room to be creative makes you think you're outsmarting the developers. No matter how simple, no matter how complicated, no matter how ugly, no matter how diabolical, no matter how absurd, if it works, it works. It's sort of like a round of bullshit, a card game where you're forced to lie to the other players without getting caught. Cheating here feels so damn good because it's encouraged and technically only illegal if you get caught. Bullshit. Oh. You can operate within the rules of the game and still feel like you're getting away with something. And that is a sensation that people really, really like. So next time you set foot in Hyrule, don't be afraid to color outside the lines. Be proud of the abominations you build. And above all, remember, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Hey everyone, thank you so very much for watching today. If you like what I do here and want to support the show, subscribing, leaving a like, sharing, and commenting all go a long way in helping the channel grow. And if you're interested in bonus content, bloopers, early access to videos, creative input on future videos, and live streams where I edit these videos and hang out with you, then for a dollar a month over on Patreon, you can have all of that and so much more. Link in the description and on screen in just a moment. Thanks so much to this month's featured patrons. Toku, Daddlefush, Elijah Asa, George, Ty Silicus, Jade Birch, Francois Labard, and I am absolutely going to get this one wrong, but thank you to Jaehoon Jiang. Thanks again for watching. I hope you're absolutely drowning in tears of the kingdom. I know I certainly am. Take care, and as always, please have yourself a damn good one. We have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok, and flat out deceived.